Hi, my name is Dr. Ben Thompson. This is the Tribal Health Podcast. Today's guest is Dr. Dirk de Ritter, the Belgian neurosurgeon that is dedicated to solving tinnitus. If you are wondering about the newest research and the newest treatments for tinnitus, definitely watch this podcast until the end. We discuss things like what are the real root causes of tinnitus? What is the scientific evidence-based treatment to back it up? And if I could pick my dream team of tinnitus doctors, I think Dr. DeRitter might be my neurosurgeon. Let's get ahead with today's episode. As a reminder, if you are in need of help for tinnitus, sign up for a free consultation with Treble Health and via telehealth on a Zoom call, we can guide you through the stages of habituation and explain your options for treatments and therapies to help with your tinnitus. Let's get ahead with today's episode. Here we go. Dr. Deritter, welcome. Please explain to us a bit about your history studying tinnitus and the brain. Well, that's an interesting history for, um, first of all, I don't have tinnitus myself, so I'm probably one of the few tinnitus researchers worldwide who um, doesn't have it. And the reason why is that I'm a neurosurgeon and when I was still working in uh, Antwerp in Belgium, I wanted to do a PhD and the PhD was about my preferred neurosurgical technique, which was a microvascular decompression surgery. Basically, what it means is that when a blood vessel taps on the auditory nerve, it can cause a short circuit, which then gives a typical kind of tinnitus, which we now call typewriter tinnitus. But when I started, that was unknown. And because I wanted to make a change in the neurosurgical approaches of microvascular decompression surgery, I looked for which pathology the results were worst. So you can do microvascular decompressions for trigeminal neuralgia, so facial pain, for pain in the throat, for vertigo, for lots of hemifacial spasm, meaning twitching in the eye and mouth. But the results for tinnitus were a lot worse than for the other pathologies. And and so then I said, well, I will embark on a, a mission to try and understand how to treat tinnitus by doing these microvascular decompressions. But I quickly realized that it's a rare cause of tinnitus and that therefore I should find another solution for the many patients that I would see with tinnitus. And considering that I was a neurosurgeon, I automatically looked at the brain. And at that time, there was a couple of papers published that suggested that hyperactivity in the auditory cortex could be related to tinnitus. Um, then I said, well, then for all the other patients that I can't treat by microvascular decompression, I will just implant an electrode on the auditory cortex and the problem should be solved, at least from a theoretical point of view. But because implanting an electrode is not something that you can do uh, right away, I um, started reading whether we could change the activity in the auditory cortex in a non surgical or non-invasive way. And I found out that you could use transcranial magnetic stimulation. But unfortunately, there was not, not such a device in Belgium. So I had to look up who uh, was doing this worldwide. And there was, um, I immediately fell on two names, one in the United States and one in London. So I went to London to Vincent Walsh, who was a, a very famous researcher who was especially known for his uh, transcranial magnetic stimulation work. And when I went there, I thought, well, this is interesting. So I then encountered a patient who had tinnitus. And so I went with her to London. We could suppress the tinnitus transiently for only a couple of seconds with this magnetic stimulation and afterwards um, asked ethical approval to implant the first electrodes and uh, which luckily worked and that's how I got started working in the tinnitus field. What is the research going into tinnitus? Is there anyone who cares about tinnitus that's researching? What are the developments? How successful is this research? Is this bringing us closer to understanding the true brain tinnitus mechanism? And is there any way to use technology or surgery or intervention to get into that system and separate the tinnitus loudness from the brain? So can we start there, please, sharing some yes. updates on that? Yes. Yeah, so um, interestingly, the, the treatments, at least from a brain point of view, are related to what we understand and what we know. I mean, already from the 20th century before Christ, the Egyptians linked uh, tinnitus or something that might have been tinnitus to uh, the ear. And therefore, all the treatments that were done before the year 2000 were trying to treat the ear. But then in 
In about 2000, uh, an American uh, Colombian neuroscientist by the name of Rodolfo Yinas was the first to come up with a theory that said, well, it's the auditory cortex, which is what I referred to previously. And so we said, well, we're, if that's the case, then it's easy. So we treat the auditory cortex and we can cure everybody. But we quickly realized that um, when you TMS or use electrical stimulation or even implant electrodes, that doesn't work for everybody. So which means that either the devices were not good, which they certainly were not, or the theory is wrong. And so you had to develop a new theory because, well, we couldn't treat everybody. So then in about 2010 or 2009, a German scientist by the name of Winnie Schley said, well, actually, it's not a problem of the auditory cortex. It's an entire network that is uh, deficient. And therefore, that makes it a lot more difficult because at the same time, network science showed that if you want to treat a network, you cannot just target any part of the network in the hope that the network will fall apart um, and therefore the tinnitus should uh, disappear. But you have to attack the, the main hubs. And luckily, in parallel with our research in, in tinnitus, there was also a lot of development in what is called network science. And this helped to realize that you have to stimulate multiple parts of the brain at the same time. However, we did not have the technology. Transcranial magnetic stimulation can only target one area at the same time. Um, at that time, the transcranial direct current stimulation, so the electrical stimulation of the brain, can also basically target maybe two areas at maximum, but still not enough. So, which means that the technological advancement was not good enough. Also, the imaging technology was not good enough to really extract the networks involved in tinnitus from the brain. Now, a little bit later, Joseph Rauschecker from the US said, well, actually, our model of tinnitus is wrong, that is focusing on the auditory cortex. It's the noise counseling mechanism that should be targeted because that's deficient. So basically what you can say is there is a, a problem in suppressing of sound and therefore there is a spontaneous generation of sound, but that's a different part of the brain that we should target. So then we said, okay, if that's the case, we should target that part of the brain, but that doesn't treat everybody else either. So then we said, well, if that is not the case, maybe it's a balance between the input and the suppression, and we have to rebalance the input and the suppression, but then you run again in the same problem that you have to activate the break, which is deficient in the noise counseling system, or you have to suppress the overactivity in the auditory cortex or a combination of the two. And so this balance problem might be relevant and can be targeted. But as far as I'm aware, nobody has yet done that because of the technological lack of material that can do it. Now, luckily enough, there is a company in Barcelona by the name of Neuroelectrics, where already in 2014, they developed a device that instead of using the traditional two electrodes, so an anode and a cathode for electrical stimulation, they have a 32-channel device in which each channel can be independently controlled. And therefore, now we can activate the noise counseling mechanism and we can inhibit the noise or sound perception mechanism in the brain to try and rebalance it. And so this technology is currently available and this is what our research is looking at right now, can we modify those two systems simultaneously in order to rebalance sound processing in the brain? Now, the question is, is that a good solution? And hopefully in the near future, we will know that. Uh, we're always optimistic. So we always think with the new research, yeah, we will we'll solve the problem. But in general, the brain seems to be a little bit more resilient to whatever we try than than what we can achieve. But this is related to the fact that our models become more and more uh, refined. Now, of course, we know that the brain is not just an electrical organ, but also a chemical organ. And so then maybe it might be better to combine medications with electricity or with magnetic stimulation. And that will be a next step that we're also trying to develop where we want to first use medication to disrupt abnormal connections in the brain, which you could do by using ketamine or psychedelics, and then rebuild normal activity 
or a normal balance between a noise cancelling system and a noise input system. And this is what we're currently going to research. We've tried this with ketamine and that doesn't work. So we tried giving ketamine and then simultaneous stimulation of the auditory tinnitus network. And then, of course, if it doesn't work, then the question again is, why does it not work? Well, probably because ketamine is not the right medication to disrupt the, the network. So now we have submitted an IRB, so ethical approval to, do, to use um, psychedelics, whether it will be MDMA or psilocybin or LSD, depending on what we can get in a medical grade, because it has to be a pure uh, product. And also changing the stimulation design to a noisy uh, stimulation, which is important because if you want to break connections, what you want to do is you want to disrupt those connections by injecting electrical noise in multiple areas so that they cannot synchronize anymore because of the noise that you inject and therefore the connections should, should disappear. So, which means that every time that you try a new research approach, it is based on the current understanding of the mechanism of tinnitus development in the brain and uh, what is available technologically, but also chemically. We were already trying for two years to get medical grade MDMA, but it is very difficult to obtain that at an acceptable cost and get it imported into New Zealand. So that's one of the major problems is that all these advances go way slower than what we would hope for. So you simultaneously have to do multiple uh, research uh, projects. But again, on the other hand, it also means that if uh, we're doing all this uh, kind of research, there's multiple other researchers in the world to do the same thing or similar kind of research that in the near future, I do think we will get uh, some breakthroughs. It might take another five years, another six years, but I have to admit that I already thought that 10 years ago as well. So it just means that there is a lot of dedicated research who are trying to develop new approaches based on our current understanding of both the technology and the, the brain activity. And that once we can combine that, that we should at least be able to treat a subgroup of people. The combinations does seem promising. And thank you for explaining that to us. I do want to share information for anyone who's watching who has bothersome tinnitus, who may have tried different treatments. Maybe you've tried something simple. Maybe you've tried a lot of different treatments and still looking for help, still bothered by the condition. In this conversation, Dr. DeRitter had mentioned TMS, transcranial magnetic stimulation. That is something that has to happen through a medical professional. That's not something that you can just sign up for yourself. So make sure you do speak with a medical professional, whether that's your physician, your ENT physician, your primary care physician, potentially your audiologist, depending on how involved they are with your tinnitus case. We also talked about neurostimulation, electrodes and devices that are stimulating the brain. We also talked about non-invasive brain stimulation. And then the more recent research here, we spoke about these uh, potential use of psychedelics in a clinical treatment modality when it's paired with brain stimulation. So all of that needs to happen through a medical professional. And what we don't want to have is someone who's listening, going and trying one of these randomly by themselves with no medical mm -hmm. professional. So anyone who's listening, make sure you do hear that message loud and clear. Please don't go trying to pursue any of these individually by yourselves. None of them have been proven to work for a majority of tinnitus cases mm -hmm. yet. So please do ask whoever is managing your tinnitus a medical professional for their opinion before you try something. That said, this is very exciting and does provide some hope to the tinnitus community. What are the important things for us to know, Dr. DeRitter, for the next 10 years, for the next six years with your specific research, what should we be looking out for? For the current uh, treatments, of course, is very different than, than the research. And I think it's very important that people understand that scientific research is one thing, but scientific research looks at treatments that work for everybody, basically. What you want to do is you want to compare a, a group who gets um, a treatment, an experimental new treatment, versus a group who doesn't get that treatment and see if the treatment is superior to the no treatment group. The major problem is that we don't know yet the sub types of tinnitus very well. For example, in pain, it is known that if you have trigeminal neuralgia, that will respond relatively good to some antiepileptic medication. 
we know that if you have migraine, that will respond not very well to um, antiepileptics, but to tryptan medication. We know that tension headache responds to other medications. So we know the subtypes, and for each subtype, there is a different treatment. And for tinnitus, we will have the same thing. Now, that being said, since we lump all people with tinnitus in one big group, the chances of finding something that will work are relatively slim because let's say you have a group where 10% of the people have a specific subtype that we don't know yet that might respond very, very well to one specific treatment, whether it's hearing aid, whether it's a medication, whether it's psychotherapy, but the 90% don't then this 10% in a statistical analysis will be drawn by the big group. And so it will not show in scientific research. Now, what does that mean for the clinic? That means that in the clinic, we should be inspired by science, but we should not be limited by science. So it does not mean that, for example, laser therapy doesn't work. From a scientific point of view, it does not work. However, that might be because there is only a subgroup of 10% of the patients who might respond to it. And if we don't know which one it is, we can't select them well. And this is the current problem that we have, is that whatever we do clinically seems to work in about 20 to 30% of the patients. Take hearing aids. Hearing aids, from a scientific point of view, don't seem to work. But in the clinical reality, 20% will have a big benefit from it. To another 20% will have some benefit from it, and maybe 60% doesn't have a benefit. Does that mean because science says that in general it doesn't do anything that we should not use it? No, we should still provide hearing aids even though it might only benefit a subgroup of the people with tinnitus. And this is a use, an important fact for people to understand that science and clinical uh, reality are not the same. And I don't follow only science when I see patients with tinnitus. No, I say, well, this seems to work and, and so many. So we start with what seems to work for most, but ultimately we also provide treatments where the science has not been done yet or has not shown yet the benefit because the subgroup has not been defined. And so in the future, the big thing will be two important approaches. One, we have to find an objective measure for tinnitus, a brain signature that tells you have tinnitus. The tinnitus should be about six or seven or eight loud and should be depressed in such a way. So once we have an objective measure, like we have a blood pressure that can tell whether we have hypertension or not. So once we have this, we can target the, the signature, the networks in the brain. And the second approach is we have to better define the subtypes. And that will dramatically change our approach in treating patients with tinnitus. Yeah, I, I completely agree on finding the subtypes. We had another podcast guest, clinical ENT physician who did research on subtypes. And his sample size was around 100 patients. And he found that a majority of tinnitus cases fit into three major subtypes, which we spoke about in depth on another podcast that we will link on this YouTube channel. But to, to summarize it, hearing loss, somatic, and stress-induced or neurological mm -hmm. tinnitus, and that covers the main subtypes. Now, what do I know? Our team at Travel Health, we do a lot of telehealth consultations. We're asking questions like, can you significantly modulate your tinnitus when you move your head, neck, or jaw? Well, if you can, that's a red flag or a marker that there may be a somatic component here. Mm -hmm. Now, hearing aids should not work to habituate somatic tinnitus. That just doesn't make sense based on our understanding of the theory. Similarly, cognitive behavioral therapy wouldn't do that much for a somatic physiological TMJ neck spine related tinnitus. So 100% agree with you. And defining the subtypes is step one, we could say step two is finding that objective test, which without the patient explaining their history can determine the subtypes. But even without the objective test, you and I both know that there are certain pieces of a tinnitus history, which point an experienced clinician, physician, ENT doctor, audiologist of saying, hey, let's try this first because this is most likely the subtype you have. So for someone listening, you may be wondering, well, what subtype do I have? Where do I fall in this? That's a good time to reach out to a tinnitus expert, a physician, 
or an audiologist who can help work you through the specifics of your case. But Dr. Deritter, I'm, I'm glad we're on the same page as that. Uh, what are the subtypes that you commonly see in your clinic? So um, the, the same uh, three subtypes that you describe, uh, we also then have a subtype of typewriter tinnitus, which should respond to Tegretol, or if they do respond, but it doesn't work anymore to a, a microvascular decompression. We have, of course, what is called the so-called objective kinds of tinnitus, like the middle ear myoclonus, which should respond to, uh, to different treatments as well. So we do have then the pulsatile tinnitus, which is a very different kind of tinnitus. So depending Depending on these subtypes, like you, Ben, we do treat them in a, in a different way. We also use medication, but that is specifically for people who say, well, my tinnitus is, uh, first of all, it's loud, it's very distressing, and importantly, it's dominantly present during, let's say, more than 60 or 70% of the time. Then we try to defocus using medication, the patient's attention from the tinnitus, irrespective of the subtype, because that's kind of a, a basic uh, background. But if they would have, let's say, somatic tinnitus, of course, we will send them to our physiotherapist. But also, if that works, but, but insufficiently, we might add some specific medication that works on temporomandibular joint uh, contractions, like cyclobenzaprine, which has been shown in a study to be beneficial. If somebody says, well, I have a benefit from alcohol, if I drink alcohol, and that happens in one third of the patients, one third it, it worsens it and one third it doesn't do anything, then we might add a drug that a Comprosat that works on these problems. So we kind of create subtypes also based on the treatments that are available. So it's a very, a very pragmatic approach, but we do something similar that depending on the subtype, so the ones with hearing loss, we will try hearing aids, even though, as I said, from a purely meta-analytic approach, there doesn't seem to be any support for it. That doesn't mean that it can't benefit. So the clinical picture of the patient with tinnitus really determines an individualized approach. There is not one general approach that you can use for everybody. I remember being at a conference of audiologists and we were reviewing the most purely scientific evidence-based approaches to tinnitus, and they seem to point mainly to cognitive behavioral therapy. And audiologists are saying, what do you mean? I have so many tinnitus patients and we use sound therapy treatment and we follow tinnitus retraining and we use hearing aids and these patients do get better. So what is the difference here? And you explain that quite well, the difference between the, the scientific arm of the community, the research, as well as the clinical practical, what is going to help someone reduce their symptoms. I wanted to bring something up. It's a question. So someone may be listening to this and asking themselves, wow, there's a lot to tinnitus. My local doctor told me that there wasn't a surgery or a medication for me and that I would have to get used to it to manage it. But I'm wondering, maybe they missed something or maybe there's more to this comprehensive view here. And I just want to validate that thought if someone's asking, what am I missing? There's a lot to tinnitus. It's a rather mysterious, tricky medical condition for most doctors. So be patient, don't give up, try to leverage medical professionals that are experienced in this because for someone who's online trying to figure out tinnitus themselves, it will cause stress, anxiety, and potentially make your loudness of tinnitus worse. So just be be cautious there of trying to solve this on your own on the internet. Dr. DeRitter, I did have a, a question for you. So you understand the brain the global brain system and the brain interactions quite well. My question for you here is the effects that you're getting or that you're experimenting with on brain stimulation, is it possible that someone can get a similar improvement or effect doing natural things like sound therapy, like cognitive behavioral therapy, counseling, meditation, changes to diet, changes to sleep patterns? Is it possible to affect the same networks in a more natural way or with more easily attainable methods as opposed to the more clinical neurosurgery methods, neuroscience methods. Yes. So if you, um, if you do TRT or CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy, 
what you see is you get a benefit of about 11 points on the THI. The THI is just a questionnaire that is used to evaluate the, the impact of tinnitus on, on daily life. However, as you said, uh, Ben, it is a uh, what seems to be or seems to have the strongest evidence, but we should not forget that the evidence does not go beyond six months. So there is no evidence that says that uh, even, uh, even these treatments do get a benefit beyond six months. Now, if you look at neuromodulation, the benefit benefit is in the same order. Acupuncture, the benefit is in the same order. Now, what does that mean, these 10 or 11 points? Well, it means that we improve the tinnitus by 10%, basically, because the score goes on 100. Now, you might say, well, 10% is not a lot, and it is not a lot. And you have to realize that the, the relationship between the loudness perception which is basically only treated, I mean, from a scientific point, by cochlear implants. They do reduce the loudness dramatically by 4.5 to 5 points on a visual analog scale. In contrast, if you look at electrical stimulation of the brain, you can get the benefit of maybe one point, but you can get a reduction by treatments such as cognitive behavioral therapy and any treatment that is more natural that can give a reduction in the focus of the brain on the presence of the sound. And if you can get that benefit from meditation, that is fine, even though there might not be scientific evidence for it, but that might just be because it hasn't been correctly uh, investigated. So if you get benefit from mindfulness or meditation or whatever treatment that can defocus your brain from the sound, that will result in a decrease in the distress. But we uh, have to be honest, and most more aggressive approaches only get a benefit in the distress and uh, almost nothing gets a benefit in the loudness perception. Yeah, clinically, when our team of audiologists, when we're counseling patients, we we frame it like this. Okay, there may be a hundred things you could try for tinnitus, but there's probably only five types of things that are performed, recommended by the experts or the professionals or those who are very specialized in this field. So let's use whatever we can that has some evidence, that has some clinical support from the professional scientific community. Let's see what makes sense for each individual person. And if we can get 5% improvement here, 10% improvement there, 15% improvement there, and 20% improvement from this other section, suddenly the patient's quality of life has changed dramatically. And despite them still having some tinnitus, it's at a lesser degree in perception, awareness, and occasionally the volume can get softer too through that process. Yeah. Yeah. So, so all this to say, yes, use multiple things that can help. Word of caution, do not try obscure or alternative or experimental treatments before this foundational approach. Try the foundational approach first, and then it's usually okay to try alternative treatments along the way. As we're wrapping up here, I want to say anyone who's listening to this on YouTube, watching this on YouTube, please comment helpful if Dr. DeRitter's conversation here has been helpful. If you've learned something or if you like what we're talking about here, please comment helpful. And Dr. DeRitter, I would like to give the last words here to you. If you'd like to touch on just final words you have, maybe the common counseling pieces that you touch on to individuals who come through your clinic, please take the floor. Yes. So when we see a patient in a clinic, what we basically start with is try to find a cause, if there could be a cause. I mean, of course, uh, and that's why they will go see an audiologist, an ENT a surgeon, and myself. The reason is, if you can find a cause, then of course you should treat it. If you can't find a cause, then depending on if the audiologist find hearing loss, we will prescribe hearing aids. If uh, the ENT find something else, we will do that. If the patients, if we think they might benefit from cognitive behavioral therapy, we'll send them to our psychologist. If they have somatic tinnitus, we will send them to the physiotherapist and uh, potentially describe medication, even though from a scientific point of view, medication does not have any benefit whatsoever on tinnitus. It might be beneficial for the associated anxiety or depression or sleeping problems that are very common in patients with uh, tinnitus. If that doesn't work, then and we will propose to go and uh, try any kind of uh, neuromodulation, which has some benefit, but it's not a lot. And if that does not work, 
then we might enroll them in some form of more research focused approach. So I fully agree with what Ben said. And this has been shown scientifically as well. If you combine, for example, TRT with medication, that works better than medication alone or TRT alone. So the combination of treatments is ultimately based on the arguments that Ben said, but also scientifically supported that a combination of treatments might j just be enough for somebody to make their life livable because most of the patients in whom you can reduce the loudness to, let's say, a level of four and where you can reduce the impact it has on uh, their quality of life, once their quality of life improves and they pay less attention to the tinnitus, that will give the support. So I agree. Work in a systematic way based on the data that you get by the investigations that you do. And that will be the currently is the still the best solution for uh, most of the patients that we see. Dr. Deritter, neurosurgeon out of Belgium. Thank you so much for being here and sharing your expertise. Thank you for being here on the Tribal Health Podcast. And for those of you watching, we'll see you on the next episode. Make sure to subscribe, 